Now that we've covered those five categories of ratios, let's take ROE, return on equity, and dig into it a little bit deeper. Remember we said that ROE is net income divided by total equity. Well, if you break it into pieces, that's what the DuPont equation is doing for you. And it's breaking those pieces down so you know what's driving ROE because it's such an important ratio. So it's, there's three, piece, three pieces, profit margin, total asset turnover, and equity multiplier. And so each of those is measuring something different. It comes from a different category. So profit margin is measuring profitability, total asset turnover is measuring asset utilization, and equity multiplier is measuring debt utilization. So if you look at the trend in ROE and then look at the trend in the components, you can see which component is driving the change in ROE over time or the differences in ROE between a firm and its peers or a firm and its industry. So let's look at a breakdown of ROE or this DuPont equation for this firm that we've been following. If we break it into pieces, we're going to get the same result as we had before, but we can see what's driving it. So profitability, remember we've said already, is trending upward to at 3.6%, and that was the one profitability ratio that was a little bit better than the industry. Total asset turnover, remember that was a little bit low because of what was going on with accounts receivable and inventory. So it's trending downward and below the industry. And um, equity multiplier is had gone up and now has gone back down, remember, because they paid off a lot of debt. So when you think about what's driving or what's what's driving the changes in ROE, if we look at 2013 to 2014, um, ROE went down significantly, and so did profitability, and debt went up. Um, 2014 to 2015, ROE went back up, and so did profit margin, and equity multiplier went back down. So we can see exactly what's driving the change in ROE. So now let's just look at what happens when we change certain things. So these, these examples are very similar to the kinds of problems that you need to be able to work. So in this case, we're looking at a snapshot and of the um, balance sheet, and we want to know, well, what would happen if the firm's day sales outstanding um, was reduced from that 45.6 that we saw down to 32 days. What would be the effect on the company? Well, first we've got to figure out how much they're selling per day. So we take sales and we divide it by the number of days in the year. And what we find out is that if you take those, um, what do we call that? Um, sales divided by days per year, so sales per day, and multiply it by 45.6, because that's how long it, it currently takes for them to collect, that means their accounts receivable would, that kind of matches the accounts receivable that they have now at 878. But if you reduce DSO to 32 days, that's going to reduce accounts receivable to 616, which frees up 261,000 in cash, meaning they're going to get that because that's sales that they've made, but they're not waiting to be paid on, paid for. So this change is initially going to increase or improve their cash position. So if you get all that cash, $261,000, what do you do with it? Well, you could further reduce debt would be one thing. Um, you could buy back stock. You could do further expansions. And so all of these things would probably improve the stock price. So as we wrap up, let's just talk briefly about some limitations to this, um, to this financial statement or ratio analysis. Um, we keep talking about how important it is to make comparisons to the industry. Sometimes it's hard to find industry numbers or it's hard to figure out which industry 
we should be comparing to based on the type of business that our firm is in. Um, it, there may be some different operating procedures or accounting practices across companies that would have an impact on their ratios. And it gets really hard to determine if something is good or bad. And so that's where, you know, it's kind of a, a cycle. That's where the comparisons are so important. But if you don't have good things to compare to, then it's still hard to say if something is good or bad. Other things, um, you know, just same kind of qualitative stuff. Average isn't necessarily a good thing. So if, you're if your performance is equal to the industry average, that doesn't necessarily say you're doing well. Um, and then think about firms that are in cyclical businesses. Immediately I think about toys. Um, those, those cycles may impact, but if you're looking at a year, maybe you've got a firm that um, their performance varies depending on economic cycles, which last much longer than a year. Um, then you may have um, top management kind of distorting the numbers. And so that's something that you have to keep in mind. So what we have to think about are these various um, qualitative factors that go beyond the ratios. Um, are all their revenues tied up in one key customer? So these are just additional questions to keep in mind when you're reviewing uh, a firm's performance. Um, what about their international business? What, what, portion, what proportion of their business comes from overseas? And so that could be a factor if they're doing business um, in particularly volatile countries. What's the firm's competitive environment? Maybe we need to do a SWOT analysis and check out all the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. What do they have cooking on the horizon? Is, if you're following Apple, have they started thinking about iPhone 9 or 10 or 12 or whatever? What, how, how are they doing in research and development? What's going on legally, politically, that could impact the firm?